Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. I'm D.H. Taylor. Today, I want to talk a little bit about oil, some economic data, and continue that process of bringing in more and more information regarding what's going on in the economy and how this will affect the general broader stock market. From there, I want to touch on a subject called psychology of trading. Just a couple of book recommendations and things like this, some experience from my past. Over the weekend, I, ha- I had started texting somebody regarding one particular uh, stock that I have as a recommendation. I just did Merrimed last Friday. As it turns out, that turned into a, a, a kind of a conversation as to what entry prices were going to be. This morning, I received an email from someone else regarding dollar cost averaging and a losing position that this particular individual is sitting on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine the two and kind of give an idea as to what I would do in this kind of situation regarding two particular uh, stocks, if you will. One of them where you're sitting on a losing position, the other one where you might be chasing the market. Let's look at some data. I don't know what I was thinking, but I got involved in a debate on TikTok, the bastion of economic data that it is. Someone had mentioned that merely 115 days ago, whatever it was, we were energy independent. So I'm showing you a picture on uh, oil production here in the United States of America. All right. So. First, we have to ask one simple question of this particular individual. What do you consider energy independent? Do you consider energy independent uh, if we consume a certain amount and produce an, uh, an amount above that and we export out the remaining, would that be energy independent? Or are you just going to listen to somebody on TV who says, we're energy independent, therefore? So let's look at some data on this. Prior to the pandemic, we were pushing about just over 20 million barrels per day usage here in the United States of America. And if you look at this chart, we're producing about 15 million barrels a day right now. It had topped out about 17 and a half million barrels per day. So if we're using 20 million and a half per day, but we're only producing 17 and a half million per day. Are we energy independent or that extra 3 million barrels a day that we have to import? Would that mean that we are no longer energy independent? I have a pretty good idea as to who she believes won the 2020 presidential election. Uh, Nonetheless, these are the data points that I wanted to show, not because I want to get involved in a TikTok debate. I don't. Uh, I got, I don't know what I was thinking when I even commented. Um, but what I did want to show is, let's look at some more charts. So this is oil prices. So we are producing an amount And it doesn't really matter whether or not we're energy independent or not. The world is producing an amount of oil. Unfortunately, we're about to see huge moves upward in demand for oil. I expect we're going to clear 70 real fast here. Uh, $70 a barrel. And the reason why is simply this. We have the driving season upon us. We're probably going to see some shortages. You're talking about a country who has... Uh, we are cleared, we're getting real close to 60 to 70% inoculation with at least one shot. 50% has cleared at least getting one shot. So I think we're, we're getting real close. We're probably about two to three weeks out from about 60 to 65% of the country being fully inoculated, vaccinated. Given that, um, It's the driving season. People are going to want to get out. They're going to want to do things. For the very first time in a very long time, I went to the grocery store just down the street here from where I'm staying, and I didn't have to wear a mask. I sort of started walking in. I was like, oh, my gosh, I forgot my mask. And I'm really cautious about that, not for my own reasons, just to be respectful and mindful of other people. Your political opinion on that is irrelevant. I do that. And that's just the way I am. I don't really care. 
you know, this is a pandemic and the, and if it helps one person, great. I don't care. I had the virus back in September. I think it was the end of September going into August, uh, October. It was very mild for me. Other people that I know didn't fare as well as me. I have a general understanding how my body's going to react to it. I'm sure I've been exposed to the virus since then. Um, nonetheless, I'm respectful and mindful and I that's how I manage my affairs. Yours is yours. Nonetheless, as we open up, more and more people are going to want to get out. And this being the driving season, the demand on oil is going to be very high. I'm expecting $70 to blow through here pretty soon because we're going to start seeing prices increase at the pump simply because supply cannot keep up with demand. You've got 340, 330, 350 million people who've been cooped up, 65% of which pushing 70% as we get into the summer even more and more are vaccinated. That to them is their passport to going back to normal. And they're going to want to party a little bit. So I expect this to move higher, much higher. The fact that we're energy independent or not is irrelevant because there's enough oil throughout the world that demand will be met at some point, but there may be price spikes here and there. This is inflationary from time to time. You'll see these spikes. It acts as a tax on the consumer that if they can't, uh, if they have to pay more and more at the pump, they're paying less and less at the restaurant that they're going to, things like that. So we'll see how that plays out. I do expect oil prices in general to continue to trend higher simply as we push forward. As for the S&P 500, Today's activity, we're pushing a little higher. I don't know that this week we're going to hit those highs again. It may be that the equity markets have shrugged off everything that's going on with regards to inflation. I'm doubtful because we're continually going to be getting reminders that there are inflationary pressures out there. Just look at the price of lumber. Lumber is through the roof. It is ridiculous how high that price is. Um, we'll see how this plays out. Oil does have a small amount of effect on the overall psychology of the market with regards to uh, interest rates and the prices of uh, the S&P 500 indexes. What is worse? sitting on a position and watching it fall or not being in a position when you know you've been wanting to get in and watching it skyrocket. I posit they're both about as equally as painful. I have been in so many different trades where there's been some issues here, there, the other thing. I've learn to become numb to the system and just say it's a process it's a process it's a process with value investing you really have to break it down to one simple thing if you pay for a stock today how much value are you going to get tomorrow given that how do you uh, figure out where your entry price is you could just merely dismiss everything and say, listen, this is a $1 stock and I expect it to be a $10 stock within two and a half to five years. Okay, so what's the big difference if it drops down to 90 cents, 80 cents? That's not a huge difference. If it's a $1 stock and it's going to 10, you're crushing it. That's a 900% return. But what if that $1 stock you were hoping to hit 50 cents? That's a big difference because now you're talking about the ability to use the same amount of money and buy twice as many shares. You're definitely right that this stock may move up, uh, although the market may be kind of sliding downwards. At the same time, there's another thing where you get into a stock and it drops a little bit. So you buy a little more. Then it drops a little more and you buy a little more thinking, oh, well, I'm sitting on a loss. I'll just average out the losses. 
And then a company turns around and says, we're taking away all our forward guidance. We don't know where we're going to be. And then you take the mother of all losses. This reminds me of um, what we like to call Saddam Hussein makes a bad trade. I think it was either the New Market Wizards or Market Wizards. Nonetheless, it's Jack D. Schwager. If you've not read this book, it's interesting. Um, I read this probably back in 1991, 92, 93. Not sure when I started reading these books very early on when I was getting involved in trading. And it opened my eyes up to the possibility of what you could do with trading. I was interested in the subject. I knew I could make a little bit of money. These guys in this book are ginormous. But this is also a 30-year-old book. What we considered ginormous back then would be even more ginormous today. Uh, you just have to inflation adjust the the what the money they were involved. Nonetheless, in the very beginning of either this book or the one before Market Wizards, uh, Mr. Schwager talks about um, Saddam Hussein makes a bad trade. I, I'm a veteran. I was in the Air Force stationed at RAF Milton Hall in England. Um, I used to do this exercise every freaking year and I hated this exercise. It was called Exercise Desert Storm. And for whatever reason, we felt it was necessary to defend Saudi Arabia. Now, mind you, this is all the way back in the late 80s up until 1990. Graham Rudman showed up and said, well, we won the Cold War against Russia. Let's go ahead and reduce troop sizes. And they offered me an out. I got out. I got out in March of 1990. Then, of course, Desert uh, Operation Desert Shield occurred starting in October. I got recalled into the California Air National Guard, I think the 163rd. Um, and so, uh, because I used to do this exercise every stick in year, so therefore I knew the exercise, I knew the fields, they recalled me. Um, it happens. I didn't really mind. Uh, nonetheless, this is something that's always stuck with me. Saddam Hussein, initially, there was no response by the international community. Then all of a sudden, someone told uh, President H.W. Bush, listen, this is kind of a big deal. We actually do care. And that turned into a really big deal. So the international community turned to Saddam Hussein and said, listen, eh, you know what? Pull back. And he said no. So they continually added pressure, building up towards a war, letting them know what the sanctions are going to be, this, that, the other thing, until ultimately Saddam Hussein had to take the mother of all losses, whereas he thought it was going to be the mother of all victories. He was taking on the international community. What was he thinking? Mr. Schwager puts this in the very beginning of, uh, it's one of the introductions to his book, so that you can see that if you don't take a small loss today, sooner or later, you're going to take the mother of all losses. Uh, and I say this because I got an email this morning from someone as I was putting together this video, and he talked about how he has been hopefully dollar cost averaging his losses. And I don't mean any kind of, I'm not like laughing at this individual or anything like this. I, you know, I'm kind of using this as an example so that other people can see this. I have been in this position myself more than once. It happens. It, it's, an, it's a process. Investing is a process. It's not an event. You don't sit there, here's a starting line, I'm going to buy today, and then in five years, that's the finish line. It's not like that. It's a continual process. You're continually going to be getting information. The economic data that I continue to bring in here is information. It's a process. It's not an event. The economy is a process. Continue to look at that so that you can rationalize or think through where your stock portfolio may be at any one particular time. One of the things I would recommend is have an objective. Have sort of a concept in mind before you get involved in this to say, listen, this is what I'm looking for the performance. If I don't see the performance, I'm going to get out. Or I'm going to end up taking the mother of all losses. So there's another book I wanted to point out um, that I think is really interesting. Uh, Trading in the Zone. I've loved this book. Uh, I think it was probably mid to late 90s. I ended up reading this. Not sure when. Had it on my bookshelf for years and years. Now it's on my um, 
iPad as an electronic book. I don't remember the last time I even opened it, but if I've ever opened it since I've downloaded it. Nonetheless, excellent book. Uh, and it talks specifically about these kinds of concepts where you need to detach yourself from emotional involvement with your trades. As a value investor, ask yourself one simple question. If you pay for a stock today, what value are you going to get over the course of a period of time? You should have a fundamental understanding of this before you even get involved. You have a number of opportunities out there. If you are specifically looking at cannabis stocks, you know, I've got many, something like 60 or 70 that I have analysis up on my website. And I'm not saying I'm the source of all things for cannabis. There are many sources out there. Do your due diligence. It's your money. It's your investments. I hope that I'm some kind of resource for some of you guys where I'm just simply breaking down the numbers and showing you, listen, here is company X. This is how they're performing, blah, blah, blah. Here is company Y. By presenting so many different companies and breaking down the numbers, hopefully you can sit there and say, you know what? I prefer X over Y because of these kinds of things that are going on. Granted, the very first time I looked at, say, Merrimed, I looked at them in late December, and I think I ended up writing them up uh, the very first week of January. Well, it was trading at 50 cents. I have a recommendation on there to buy it at 50 cents. Just three, four weeks ago, it was trading at 60 cents, and I felt pretty sure it was going to drop back down to 50, and I was going to load up. It's trading over a buck. My conversation I had with the individual over the weekend, it was trading at 95 cents. This thing's moving. Even I'm sitting there saying, oh, man. <sighs> it's a process. Let's move forward. I want to kind of look at some bullet points that I have here. Uh, dollar cost averaging, I never think is an excellent idea. I think it's an idea. I don't think it's an excellent idea. And I'll let you kind of interpolate that as you will. But if you have a position that you're absolutely certain, you're laying out all the metrics that a particular company is looking at. An excellent example is Halo, Halo Collective. I love Halo. I think they're going to do some great things as long as they can get to the finish line. What do I really think is going to happen with Halo Collective? I would give it an above 50% possibility that they get acquired. And then whoever picks them up then has the ability to fund them the rest of the way to get to the end line and uh, finish line. Given that, Halo is still an excellent opportunity, even if they get picked up, because whoever picks them up has a lot of cash. With any luck, it's not canopy growth. Oh, for the love of God. Um, or, or one of those other ones. That's a possibility. And I would bail out so fast, it's not even funny. Nonetheless, Dollar cost averaging, that's sort of the Saddam Hussein effect where if you don't take a loss up front, eventually you're going to end up taking the mother of all losses. So if a stock is trading at, say, 10 cents or a dollar or whatever it may be trading at, 10 bucks, and it drops down to 750 or 75 cents or seven and a half cents, should you add more? That depends. And there's a, a response to every yes, no question I can always fire at you. That depends. It's very possible. And probably the, one of the reasons why I'm not married is because I can't look at a woman in the face and tell her yes or no. Do you want to go out to dinner? Well, that depends on what, where are we going to go? I can say that depends to every single yes, no answer for eternity. Very frustrating, but it opens up your eyes to possibilities. Saddam is saying is making a bad trade. If you're looking at a $10 stock and it drops down to $7.50, should you add more? That depends. Why would you be adding more? If you think it was, if you're dead certain, hey, at 10 bucks, I love this stock. Here's a hundred reasons why. And it drops down to 750. You know what? My timing was poor at 10 bucks. The market is offering me a better opportunity. If you're looking at it from that perspective, instead of, ooh, wow, uh, something happened, guidance has changed, this, that, the other thing, now I'm bailing, I'm getting out. 
that's probably not the best opportunity to start adding in. I get the concept, dollar cost average. Well, if you're sitting on a small loss and you put in another order at 750, what happens if it drops to five? Now your $10 position is down 50%. Your 750 position is now down what, 33 and a half percent? What happens if it drops to 250 after you've just added in even more at five bucks? The dollar cost averaging thing, if you're taking a loss because the fundamentals have changed about the company, that's not, in my opinion, an excellent idea. It's an idea, but not necessarily an excellent one. If you're dead certain that a stock is going to be going up regardless, and it does, Mr. Market offers you the opportunity of a 25% discount, and you still feel that the fundamentals are exactly the same, why not? Why not add a little more at 750 or 75 cents or seven and a half cents? Um, opportunity costs. This is a concept that if you're sitting on stock A and it's taking a bloodbath because the fundamentals have changed and you're hopeful that, listen, in two and a half years, I know they'll get there. Maybe you're a sundial owner. Mm, do I have to do that? Take that wooden spoon and just dig it in there? Sundial is a company that is acquiring some excellent other companies. In the meantime, their core fundamentals suck. Um, you're giving up the opportunity to get involved in another company every day that you're in that trade or that position, whatever you want to call it. If you're giving up that opportunity, that's your opportunity cost. You need to weigh this decision every day and it may weigh on you heavily. If it does weigh on you heavily, might I recommend going back and looking at the psychology of trading uh, or trading in the zone, the book I uh, posted just a little earlier. This is a book that kind of deals with that pain you're feeling, trying to remove that ego out of the uh, process of investing and just sitting there saying, listen, I'm involved in this company because of X, Y, and Z. Their price is right here. I'm comfortable with that. If it drops, you know, maybe I'll add some more as long as the fundamentals don't change. But if the fundamentals change, why are you still holding on to that? Because you're giving up the opportunity to add into another position that might actually outperform what you're losing on. Keep the bigger picture in mind. This is a once in a generational opportunity for all of us to create significant wealth. Never again is the world going to decriminalize and legalize cannabis. You've got to pick the right stocks. Canopy growth is not the right stock, in my opinion. I know that some, some of you guys are sitting there holding on positions and just uh, taking it. And, you know, we all got bought into the hype in the very beginning in 2018 when Canada went and legalized. Every one of us got involved in that, but that wasn't the right timing. We saw the bloodbath all through 2019 into the very late uh, 2020, where some of these prices are just absurdly discounted. A lot of these stocks are still absurdly discounted. So although you may not get the absolute best absurdly discounted price, look at Merrimed. It's trading over a buck today. I had hoped at 60 cents that it would have dropped a mere 15% to get 50 cents so I could sit there and turn to everybody who's been following me and say, hit it, hit it hard. It's trading at over a buck now. It just shot up 10 cents today. That's over 10% over because it started from a basis of 95 cents. Um, the bigger picture is this is a 5 750 1250 maybe even $1,750 stock. At this point, we're starting to tra uh, chase it. <sighs> That's painful. It's almost equally as painful as sitting on a losing position when you know you've got a true winner and it's starting to run. That's a tough one. You wanted to get as many shares as you possibly could. I totally get that. You're going to need to sit there and figure out where that balance is, but you need to keep the bigger picture in mind and, and sit there and understand that this Merrimed is a stock that is probably a $5 stock. 
you didn't pick it up at 95 cents. You didn't pick it up at 85 cents, 75 cents, 65 cents. It's now at a buck five. This becomes the mother of all opportunity costs if at some point you don't start pulling the trigger. I Even I thought that it was going to come down. Something's happening with Merrimed. It's running away. Will this continue? Boy, if I had that. Boy, if I had that information. Um, another thing, set your objectives out front. Every single quarter. So we've been given all the, uh, not all of them, but a lot of companies, we've been given information as to what's going to happen over the course of this year. So I've put out objectives based on the information, the future guidance that these companies have given us. We have a fundamental understanding of where some of these stocks are going to be. Given that information, we can sit there and say, okay, so this is a $2.50 stock. Given the amount of revenue that they're going to generate, the bit to profitability, this, that, and the other thing, I believe this might be a $7.50 stock, maybe a $10 stock, maybe $12.50, whatever your objective is. If it's starting at $2.50, your objective should be that two things. Number one, the fundamentals remain in line. You came up to the conclusion that this is a $7.50 stock based upon the information you were given. So your objective should be that we continue to get this information. The information that continues to come in from the company every quarter, this coincides with what they told us at the beginning of the year. If it does, your objective should be met. But there may be outlying factors that weigh in on that. So you need to keep that objective in mind and always stay focused on that. As a value investor, if your objective is one week from now, uh, uh, you know what, that might not be, this might not be the right information for you. You sound more like a stock trader who's just looking for a quick hit and quit, looking for a pop up in the stock. What I'm trying to do here is show information that people can use and sit there and say, you know what, over the course of say, one year, two and a half years, five years, 10 years, 25 years, I'm going to build a massive portfolio. And this is my opportunity today. My time horizon is way down the line. So figure out what your objective is before you even get involved in this. And then as I'm doing quarter by quarter, I'm bringing that information back and sitting there saying, listen, the information is still in line with what they gave us we should hit our objectives. Um, you need to understand risk. At any particular time, we may see some shifts. So you need to be able to reduce it. Let's look at Merrimed. They've got one of the best selling edibles. All right, period. So all of a sudden, is something going to happen to the best selling edible company out there? Well, that possibly does exist. We hear things all the time, but this is a company that I think that they're going, they've already earned a lot of customer loyalty and therefore should any minor thing happen in the future, I think it would be a blip in the road, but not every company is selling the very best edible. Merrimed happened to be number one. I think it was just last quarter or the quarter before. Okay, great. That means everybody else is number two or lower. Somebody may come back with an even better product. No idea. Nonetheless, keep understanding where those risks are. I think Merrimed is going to be one of the top rated edibles out there for a very long time. By saying top rated versus number one, this gives a little bit of latitude because someone's going to want that top position. Always, and I've just said this, Always keep the bigger picture in mind. Always. I'm looking one year, two and a half years, five years, 10 years, 25 years down the road. What is your big picture? When you look at these stocks as a value investor, you're going to have the opportunity to kind of figure out where you are, where you're going to be, and in what period of time. Value investing rarely do you see stock movements that are sort of crypto-esque? Although this is cannabis, I do expect we are going to see big moves.
So there's the chart on Merrimed. That's the do, uh, daily chart over the past several days. The only thing I can conclude is there's a very big whale who's swallowing a lot, period. And I think Merrimed has the opportunity to kind of help these smaller stocks that we've been sitting on waiting for some price movement. I think Merrimed is going to be the company right now where we're going to start seeing, begin the process of seeing others seeing how there is opportunity in cannabis. Merrimed has the, of course, the distinction of being on the NASDAQ. It does not have the letter F at the end in case you were wondering how that all breaks down uh, from a symbol standpoint. Um, given that, I don't know that we're going to see 50 cents again. So although I had a call of, yeah, start acquiring, that price point never happened when it was trading at 60 cents. Um, and now we're looking at the, at the possibility of just merely chasing the market. You're going to have to understand the risks involved. You're going to have to look at the bigger picture and answer those questions. I can't answer that for every single one of you because every single one of you has a different viewpoint. This is what you're going to have to look at. What I can do is point out the information that you would need to make a, a, an educated investment. You're still going to have to do some due diligence. And it may be, looking at this chart, you may have to bite the bullet and go ahead and chase this. I want to say thanks for stopping by the site. If this is the first time you're stopping by, please, by all means, i got a free emails newsletter listed down below. Hit the link land on the page, fill it out. Every day I'll send you a, an email. I try to do a uh, detailed analysis of a specific company in the afternoons, plus this morning thing that I do, bringing in some economic data, a little bit of tidbits here and there, and then talk about the cannabis industry. A lot of the, what I talk about applies across the board. For those of you who don't know, I also have uh, a coffee company. I am in the process of refurbishing entirely a 1998 Land Rover Discovery 50th anniversary edition, uh, special edition. I got to go to a junkyard as soon as this thing gets uh, uh, posted, this particular video, and I finish up with a few other things. Nonetheless, um, I'll be heading back across the border through Mexico, going through Central America and all through uh, the northern parts of South America. You can try my coffee. I appreciate the support. If you're interested, 100% uh, access to my website, including my top picks, five bucks a month. There's links down below. Appreciate you stopping by. Hit those links. We'll see you soon.